All right. Well, hello and happy Groundhog Day. And I am going to begin with a very special affirmative prayer. I call it spiritual mind treatment to distinguish it from the way we usually pray. But accept what you like about it and ignore the rest. So this word is being spoken for each one. And if there is anyone in your heart that you desire to have included, just think of their name now and know that this word does include them. There is only one life and this is it. It is this entire universe and everything in it. It is all that has been, is now, and all that shall be. And each one is right here, right now, fully present, realizing that all of this life is here now, all of it, and that whatever anyone desires to experience, he or she or they may experience it. And so this particular divine appointment with this talk and the ideas that flow through each one's mind is something that is divinely arranged for the highest and greatest good of each one so that each one receives the good they desire, the fulfillment of that which is in the heart, the answer, the guidance, the solution, the healing, even the transformation. All the good that is divinely possible is here now, and each one claims that which is theirs. And this talk and all of the ideas that are within each one bring to each one an awareness of truth that does indeed set them free. I am grateful that each one receives this good and I know it is done because that omnipotent law that knows how to do it does do it. And so it is done. Hallelujah. So I love that movie Groundhog Day. And Harold Ramis was surprised himself. He said that a few days after the release, way back in February of 1993, there were Hasidic Jews outside the theater holding signs that read, Are you living the same day over and over again? And over the decades since this movie, this is 2023, what's 30 years? Um, every single religion has claimed a special spiritual insight in this movie. So... Every year, as I look at this movie again, watch it, enjoy it, think about it, I always come up with a, a fresh new outlook about it, which is why this movie is just so everlastingly good. And this year, I thought about time. And Bill's dilemma, and our dilemma. He was upset in the movie because he was trapped in the same day over and over again. And he said to a couple of fellow drinking buddies in a bar, what would you do if you were stuck in one place and every day was exactly the same and nothing you did mattered? And one of the drinking pals says, that about sums it up for me. And so, we do feel like we're living the same day over and over again or actually having that same experience over and over again. And what it took Bill Murray, Phil, in the movie uh, into a realization was that he was upset because he was trapped in the same day even though... He was living forever. And for those of us who are not seemingly trapped in that same day, we might be looking at our lives as being finite and wishing we could live forever. 
So the question that comes to my mind is, is this. If some being with the power to grant you a wish offered to you the chance to live one day of your life forever or not, the only catch being you don't get to choose the day. You don't get to choose the place. Would you choose it? And how about this? Would you choose it if you were also told that the day that you would be trapped in is one of your generally lousy days, one of the lousier days of your life. Phil says, why this day? In his mind, being stuck in it, it was the worst day of his life. Um, and then he, he recalled another day where he was on vacation on a tropical island and he was with a woman and they made love in the ocean and uh, he's like, why couldn't I have lived that day over and over again? Instead, he's, he's not even in his own town, in his own home. He's living this day trapped in Punxsutawney, which he hates. And it's winter. It's February 2nd. You know, cold, bitter winter. He's like, why did I get stuck in this day? Why didn't I get stuck in that day? So our question to think about is, would we choose to live our equivalent of Phil's day if we had eternal life. We complain or think about or about time. We have too much of it. We have too little of it. We're bored with it. I don't have enough of it. I wish I had more of it. I wish this day was over. And we're begin being given this gift and especially watching Phil, of thinking about time and realizing it's how we use it. Harold Ramis said, well, actually, in the movie, Rita says, when she finally gets Phil's predicament and that he's stuck in this day and she really gets it and that he's miserable in it, she says, sometimes I wish I had a thousand lifetimes. Maybe it's not a curse. It just depends on how you look at it. And of course, that's true of everything. Whether we're stuck in the same day and stuck in a lousy town or we're seemingly living different days, it all depends on how we look at it. So how are we using this gift of time? Harold Ramis said he thought the point of this movie was that you can live better, that you can have a better life, and you can change. And when you do change, you get those rewards that you think you want from life. Nothing on the outside has to change. Now, in our particular teaching, the science of mind, that's, that's what we teach. It is done unto you as you believe. And nothing has to change. Ernest Holmes, in his textbook, The Science of Mind, writes somewhere in there that he felt that the greatest demonstration or, or the most wonderful demonstration is by just staying right where you are and doing your spiritual work to change your consciousness, your beliefs, the beliefs that are in your consciousness, to do that spiritual work so that you are lifted up out of your present circumstances and gently placed into a whole new experience. I love that statement that he has in the textbook and I have chosen to demand that kind of transformation in my life and 
There have been times when it actually has happened. When I have sat in my room, maybe for two or three days, studying the the spiritual truth written in the Science of Mind textbook, contemplating, doing the spiritual work, I call it spiritual mind treatment, to change my beliefs, to change my beliefs. And going back to what spiritual mind treatment definition is, for me, it is changing. I'm doing a prayer with the intent of having that divine law, that divine presence, call it God, call it that greater power, whatever it is, have it not change my world, to change what I believe about this world. And to do that without doing anything on the outside. And at a certain point in those times when I have, you know, set that determination, gotten that determination and set that attention and made that commitment and did the work, in those times that I did it, after two or three days of intensive spiritual focus on the truth, the truth, the truth, Yes, I had a breakthrough, realization of truth. Realization of truth is not just mental, so you can't study, study, study to get it, although that was my approach. Spiritual re realization is an act of grace. It descends upon the one who is open to receiving it. And so I had gotten myself into a state of receptivity. And when that realization of the truth, of the meaning of the words that I was studying came upon me, it wasn't just mental, it was physical, emotional. It was everything in me agreed agreed with the spiritual truth. There was no belief in me that disagreed anymore. And every single time I did that and came to that realization, my outer world miraculously and instantaneously, that is immediately after this realization experience, my world changed. I got a phone call. I had a healing. I everything changed maybe not the stuff in my physical environment but new jobs uh, new people walked into my life immediately and so we know that that is spiritually possible and we want it and we want it and how do we get there well we're stuck right with our today consciousness we are stuck with what we've got our beliefs right here and now and just like Phil, we get that message somewhere, maybe from a Rita or divinely inspired or maybe even this talk, where it just we realize it just depends on how you look at it. And then we change how we look at it, which is what Phil did. He started looking at his day and... For him, he started looking at Punxsutawney and he started looking for the good that he could find in it. And so he, we discover him in the same old cafe at a different time of day and he's reading a book. You didn't see him reading a book the whole rest of the movie. So he was seeing, we catch him reading a book and the radio is on and he hears some beautiful piano music and he realizes, I love the piano. I would like to play it. And he me immediately rushes to the only piano teacher in town. And she's in the middle of a lesson. And he's like, I want to get started right here, right now. And he offers her $1,000. $1,000. And with that baby step of the first lesson, he becomes quite an amazing pianist in his final experience of the day at the end of the movie. And so he does other things. He's reading, taking piano lessons. Clearly, somehow, he's learning ice sculpting because at the end of the movie, he does this beautiful sculpture 
of Rita's beautiful face, and he's, he's quite talented at it. But as he looks around Punxsutawney, he also starts noticing the other people and observing them and what's happening in their day over and over and over again. And he thinks about them so much so that he figures out how to help them so that they don't have to experience some of the awful things that they are experiencing without his intervention. And so we see him pull, you know, walking up to a carload of <clears throat> elderly women who get a flat tire and they don't know what they're doing. And he zooms up there with a jack and another tire. And he says, he's right there before they get out of the car. And he's like, ladies, I'm here. I'm here to help you. I happen to have a jack and I happen to have a tire. I'll change a tire. No trouble whatsoever. Now, what does it matter to him whether these ladies get their tire changed by him or they have to wait or get upset or who knows what they did because we never get to see what they do without his intervention, but we know it, at the very least it's uncomfortable. It's not life-threatening. But he sees that he can do something. And he even plans the timing of it. He thinks about them so much that he has to, that day, arrange to get the jack and the tire and be there at that moment to help them. Why? And we also see him with a young boy who's climbing a tree and he falls out of it and he realizes he's like a couple seconds too late so he runs and he catches the kid. And the kid doesn't thank him. He gets nothing out of it and his back hurts having ca caught this heavy little kid. And yet he does it again and again. So what is it the question for us, what is it that we do with our here, our now, where we are, with the people we've got to deal with, what are we doing with it? Our theme for the year is being here now and knowing that our good is here now. No delay, no waiting for it. And we start we begin with the end in mind. And what is that end? With Phil, there was no end, right? He, he's going to live forever. But he discovers that every single moment of this one precious day matters to him. It matters to him. He had lived it, what, 10,000 times where it didn't matter to him. And he saw that it didn't matter to anybody else when it didn't matter to him. Oh, but, oh my goodness, when every moment started, I can't believe I'm tearing up, but there it is, right? When every moment started mattering to him, at the end of this last glorious day, we see that he matters to everyone whose lives he touched. And he touched quite a few. And he matters now also to Rita. Sorry. Oh my gosh. This is an eternal truth. And so it, what we can all take from this and what I'm taking it from it today is it doesn't matter whether we have enough time or too much time. It doesn't matter if we have eternity or the next moment gone. What matters is we are here now in this moment. And this moment matters depending upon how we perceive it. If we perceive this day as a throwaway day and throwaway moments that don't matter, then that's what we get. But when we realize this gift of life is to be lived here now, this moment matters. And it doesn't matter 
whether we're doing the trivial or something momentous. What matters is it matters to us. And when it matters to us, it matters to everyone. So that's our lesson for this year with Groundhog Day. Recommend watching the movie and seeing what you get out of it. There's just so much there. Very, very rich. Because all of us have been given this gift of life and all of us are trying to figure out how to live our best life. It begins now. And so let me finish with a little closing spiritual mind treatment just for you. The, this word has been spoken for each one. This gift of life is given and each one accepts it, is aware of it, and recognizes its value. And each one has a whole new insight about this gift of life here now. And each one is more aware of all of the options, choices, opportunities that are here now in this moment. And each one with greater wisdom than before chooses to perceive this moment in a deeper, richer, more wonderful way than ever before. And because of this choice and this valuing of this precious moment, that each one's experience of life is so much happier, so much richer, so much more wonderful, so much more personally enjoying than they have ever known before. I am grateful that this is truth. And so I release this word to that great law that does the doing, making it so, and it is made so, and so it is. So thank you for joining me, and enjoy the next moment. Bye-bye.